Hello and welcome to this Sunday's worship service of Clevedon Family Church. It's good to have you join us online to worship God and to celebrate his goodness. And I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here at CFC we're very excited because we're about to open our building and meet together uh, in person for the first time since the beginning of lockdown. And if you're part of our church family and you're on our email list, then you'll have had details in an email uh, of how we're doing that by starting with a midweek service this coming Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. I won't trouble you with the details this morning because uh, they're in the email. But if you aren't on our address uh, list and you would like details of that service, and the conditions, of course, uh, which we all have to meet in order to hold the service, uh, please get in touch. You can get in touch. The details are on our website, uh, www.clevelandfamilychurchalloneword.org. And just a reminder to those who are planning to come to the service, and we hope you will, uh, please book in by replying to the email by this evening, that's Sunday evening. Uh, it will be very helpful to us to know if you're coming so that we can arrange the seating. For the time being, Sunday services will continue online. So next Sunday we'll be here again on YouTube and on our Facebook page. So let's ask God's blessing on our worship time today. Holy God, our Father in Jesus Christ, we praise and thank you for your wonderful goodness and the ways you have blessed our lives. We ask you to send the Spirit to work among us, to open the eyes of our hearts to behold your glory, and to release us to, to bring you worship that will honour you and bring blessing to us. Amen. Now we're going to uh, worship God uh, by in, uh, in singing as we sing, Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name, and blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, or I walk through the wilderness. Blessed. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness shrills is in the still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Take away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Hi kids, how you doing this week? It's great to be doing church with you again. Now, this week, some of you are going back to school. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to get your brains working a little bit. Uh, so we're gonna have a little quiz. I've got pictures of some famous people who are nearly always seen together. And I want you to tell me who they are. But because that will be too easy, uh, I've covered up part of the picture. First, you'll only see the eyes. Uh, then I'll show you a little bit more of the picture. See how quickly you can guess who the people are. I'll move over here so we can put the pictures up, uh, up here. Okay, who can these two people be? They're always often seen together. Hmm, strange eyes. This is a cartoon, isn't it? Uh, and this one over here, hmm, unusual sort of eyes. I wonder, who can that be? Did you get it? Have you got it? Let's show you some more of the picture. Hmm, maybe now you got it if you didn't before. Let's show who it is. Hey, it's Scooby-Doo and Shaggy. Now, here's another couple, two people who are often seen together. And uh, we're in the real world now, these are real people, aren't they? Yeah, a celebrity pair. Now, who can they be? You get it from the eyes? Oh, let's see a bit more of the picture. Got it now? Hey, it's Ant and Deck, of course. Ant and Deck, often seen together. What about these two, another celebrity couple? Uh, who can these two be? Mm, nice eyes, yeah? They're very fancy eyes. Get it from the eyes? Let's see a bit more of the picture. Got it now? It's Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. Now, what about this lot, this, these two, uh, finally? Uh, back into kids' stuff, are we? Yeah, this is something that my children, my boys, used to love this show when they were young. Who can you, can you get it from the eyes? Show a little bit more of the picture. Got it now? Of course. It's Bob the Builder and Wendy. Now, how did you get on? I expect you've got most of them. Maybe you've got all of them because you're smart. Uh, now, we were saying that some of you guys are going back to school this week. Some of you will be excited about that because schools can be a great place to be. You know, you do interesting and exciting things. You see your friends and you learn lots of interesting, lots of stuff that will be useful to you as you grow older. But some of you might be less excited about going back to school. Some of you might be a bit nervous even maybe, or excited and nervous at the same time because it's been a long time since you were at school. Now what always helps me whenever I'm nervous about something is to remember that I'm never alone. Someone is always with me. After Jesus had died and come alive again, he came back to his friends and he said a very important thing to them. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of time. Wow, you know, Jesus could promise them that. And he did promise them that. And if you're a friend of Jesus, even though you can't see him right now, you can know that he's always with you wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Now, I think that's great to have a friend like Jesus who is always with me. And we're going to sing a song now, the one, I, the one called I May Live in a Great Big City. You can do the action, remember? Uh, I may live in a great big city. I may live in a village small. I may live in a tiny house. I may live in a tower tall. I may live in the countryside. There are the hills. I may live by the sea. 
And then we shout, but, don't we? Because it's, but, wherever I live, I know that Jesus always lives with me. And remember, we shout, but, really loudly. You know, let's wake everyone up who might still be asleep. Let's sing the song. remember God loves you very much and Jesus is always with you so stay well stay happy and we will see you all again very soon
You chose the cross with every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross. of songs you wore for us and crowned us with eternal life you chose the cross i know your soul was overwhelmed with pain obedient to death you overcame i'm lost in chains of my disgrace you chose the cross Up from the grave victorious you rose again so glorious yeah you chose the cross the sorrow that surrounded you is mine not my will, but just be done, you cried. I'm lost in wonder, I'm lost in love, I'm lost in praise for evermore, because of Jesus. Good morning. Please join us in our prayers of intercession. Lord Jesus, I come to you today and thank you for the privilege to pray for others as well as for myself. I thank you that through your name I can come boldly before you and pray with confidence according to your will and knowing that you hear me. I lift up those in my neighbourhood and in my church. Bless all those who follow you and help them to influence others to good. Let them be salt and light, pointing others towards you. Deepen their love for you and the people around them. Guard them from hypocrisy and from giving in to temptations that could harm the cause of Jesus Christ. Turn the hearts of parents towards their children and families towards you. Help them to live your values and make them strong in their faith. Lord, strengthen my own family and those closest to me. Lord, I pray for all in authority, Lord, especially Elizabeth, our Queen. I pray for teachers, um, politicians and all leadership, both locally and throughout the world. Be with them, Lord, and surround them with godly counsellors who will exercise integrity and work for justice and morality. Be in their hearts, Lord, in their mouths and in their minds, and help them to esteem you and not to dismiss you. Help them to exemplify your values and give them confidence in their decisions. Lord, I pray for young people and children as they return to their schools, colleges and universities in the next few weeks. Give them courage, Lord, in these times of uncertainty and doubt to bravely go through their everyday lives and commit their minds to their studies. Send them your comfort, Lord, and, and your coming presence. I pray, Lord, for all doctors, nurses and key worth at workers, both locally and across the world. Lord, make them brave and give them your powerful protection as they carry out their daily duties, curing, caring, helping, comforting and protecting the rest of society. I pray for all who are sick, Lord, and all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Lord, give them your comfort and healing and send your calming presence to all who are without help. We pray especially for those we know 
be with Grant in hospital as he works with his physiotherapist to regain his strength and mobility. I pray for the lost, Lord, for the lonely, and for those who are imprisoned behind both visible and invisible walls. Please protect the defenceless, Lord, and hold them close to your heart. I pray for all those who tell the good news of Jesus to the people of our world, and for all persecuted believers. Lord, give them your bravery and wisdom, Lord, and give them your powerful protection. Strengthen believers everywhere. Lord, thank you for listening to all our many needs. There are so many, Lord, but you deal with them all. Your name is powerful and your power is great. We thank you, Lord. Our reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from the first to the 10th verses and then down to verse 16. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And then down to verse 16, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Amen. I don't know if you remember your English classes at school. You were probably taught, as I was, that when you see the word therefore, you should ask what it's there for. If you're familiar with the letters of the Apostle Paul, you'll probably have noticed how many times he uses the word therefore or so uh, interchangeably as we heard in our NIV translation. Therefore or so uh, are joining words and they have a particular use. They say what follows is a consequence of what has gone before. And today I want to home in on Paul's use of therefore in our passage from 2 Corinthians 5 and particularly verse 16. When we're looking at a therefore, it's important to note that a therefore is not normally reversible. For example, I could say, uh, I love my wife, therefore I try to do things that will please her and make her life easier and not harder. And that is an irrefutable statement, isn't it? it you know, behaving like that is a natural and necessary consequence of authentic love. If I routinely, deliberately did things that caused her pain and made her life harder, unless I was ill in some way, it would be a sign that I didn't really love her. But if I reverse that statement, then it's not necessarily true. If I said, uh, I try to do things that will please my wife and make her life easier and not harder, therefore, I love her. You would be right to say, hold on, uh, not necessarily. 
because there might be other reasons why I act like that. I might be trying to store up some, some brownie points so that I can get away with something down the line. I might be a conflict avoider. I might be a people pleaser. I might just be scared of my wife. So therefore isn't reversible. What comes after therefore is a consequence of what's gone before and not vice versa. So when Paul says, therefore, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, he's saying the reason we don't regard anyone from a worldly point of view is what he just said. And when we look at what he just said, essentially we find the gospel. So here's the general principle. The gospel must shape our beliefs, our attitudes and our behaviour, and not the other way around, where our beliefs, attitudes and behaviour uh, shape our reading of the Gospel. It seems obvious, but it's far more of a challenge than you might think. When we come to faith, uh, we come not as a blank slate, but with a set of beliefs, attitudes and a pattern of behaviour already in place. And even if we come to faith at quite a young age, these things are quite deeply embedded. And of course the other challenge is it's very hard to identify what these are in ourselves. Other people can often see them clearly. We can see them in others, like looking at the back of your neck, you know. Everyone else can see the back of your neck. You can see everyone else's the back of their neck, but you can't see your own. So what apart from the gospel might be influencing our beliefs, our attitudes and our behaviour? Well, maybe our life experience. If we were to look at the issue which Paul deals with here, how we regard other people, if we've had a bad experience with a person of a particular social class or personality type or race or a colour, it's natural for us to regard other people who have that characteristic with suspicion or dislike, even if they have done nothing to us. So sometimes our life experience shapes our beliefs, attitudes and behaviour. But from what I've seen in others and, and in myself, I think we're more likely to have simply been influenced by our parents. It's an interesting exercise to do, you know, to, rec to compare our beliefs, our attitudes and our behaviour with those of our parents. And ask, have I actually examined and thought about these things? Or did I just get them from my parents? You know, where did I get my thing? You know, the thing that drives me, the thing I'm passionate about, the thing I put on the left-hand side of my therefore. Now, in the Christian church, some people's thing is social justice, creating a fairer world. Uh, where people with wealth and power don't oppress and exploit the poor and the powerless. What's wrong with that in Christian terms? Nothing. I believe these things are clearly biblical and important. On the other hand, uh, some people's thing is uh, traditional family values. Or they're passionately committed to promoting conservative moral values on sexual behaviour and sexuality. What's wrong with that in Christian terms? Nothing. I believe these things also are biblical and important. The problem in Christian terms is when any of these things becomes the thing for a Christian. When any of these things appear on the left hand side of our therefore. Reading Paul's letters it's striking how little time he spends perseverating about the state of the world or the state of the nation. Now, in, in Paul's time, uh, Roman culture and Roman power ruled. And Roman culture and Roman power was corrupt and morally decadent. And yet, in all those letters Paul wrote to the churches, I can't think of one instance of him complaining or even commenting on the dreadful state of things. And that's because Paul's thing was the gospel. On the left hand of side of Paul's therefore, you will always find the gospel. Now of course there were things on the right hand side of the therefore, 
uh, convictions, attitudes and behaviour that flowed from his belief in the gospel. But the gospel was always the driver for Paul. And the question each of us has to ask is, am I sure I've got things the right way round? Is the gospel really shaping my beliefs, attitudes and behaviour or are these things shaping my reading of the gospel? Because getting our therefore the wrong way round is a sign of something wrong in our faith and it has consequences that are damaging to us and to the kingdom of God. When a Christian's thing becomes something other than the gospel, the cause is invariably either a lack of confidence in the gospel or a lack of appreciation of the gospel. And either of these things is a cause for concern, isn't it? Now, Paul's experience on the Damascus Road left him with both confidence and appreciation in the gospel. He knew he was saved and he never got over the fact that he was saved. So is it the same for you? Are you confident in the gospel message and do you properly appreciate your salvation? And if you're not filled with a sense of wonder that God saved you, are you sure that you are a net gain and not a net drain on the work of the kingdom? Because that is very often the effect of a loss of confidence in and a loss of appreciation of the gospel. We become ineffective in serving Jesus and we might even become a nuisance in the kingdom of God, not least because we so easily become worldly, self-righteous, judgmental, and because we tend to overlook some of the basic principles of Christianity found in the teaching of Jesus, such as the imperative to love our enemies, to forgive from the heart those who wrong us, and to bless those who persecute us. Without these principles, Christianity easily becomes something hard and ugly because it ceases to be authentic Christianity. So no Christian can ever afford to let anything but the gospel be on the left-hand side of their therefore. And if we discover that something is there in place of the gospel, we need to do an urgent and thorough reset through repentance and a return to the basic principles of the gospel. We need to recover our confidence and our sense of wonder that in Jesus, God saved us. As to how to do this, well, Paul says our confidence is produced by the Holy Spirit. So the way to, re to gain or to regain our confidence in the gospel is to do the things that facilitate the Spirit's work in us. And these are the simple things that have been with this church since the year dot. Prayer, Bible reading, self-examination, participation in the worship of the church, and acts of kindness. Not rocket science, certainly. Not very exciting, maybe. But they're what we've got, and they work. So let's have a look at how the therefore works in our reading. Paul says that as followers of Jesus, we regard, that is, we assess the value of other people differently to the way the non-Christian world does. And we do that because of the nature of the gospel we believe. And Paul gives us the two features of the gospel which cause Christians to do that. And surprise, surprise, they turn out to be the two central aspects of the gospel. In the Christian life, the main things are always the plain things. And the plain things are always the main things. Firstly, in verses 1 to 9, we have the reality of eternal life and our confidence in it. It's vitally important to have that on the left side of our therefore because that's what makes the right hand side possible. It's what makes living as a follower of Jesus possible. The Christian life is founded on the fact that this life is not all there is. 
Furthermore, that the next life, the one followers of Jesus inherit through faith in him, is much, much better than this one. In our reading, Paul focuses in on the way that our bodies will be much, much better than the ones we have now. He likens the body we have now to a tent, and the one we're going to get in our resurrection body uh, to a house. I like camping. I love camping, but I wouldn't want to live in a, in a tent. Ask a refugee in a camp, ask a, a person living on the streets of Bristol whether they would prefer to live in a tent or a house. You will only get one answer, a house. Maybe only uh, those who've had to live in a tent can really get the full impact of what Paul is saying here. But think about it. Think about all the nice things you enjoy about and appreciate about your house. And how it would be to be living without those things, to be living in a tent instead. And Paul says your present body is like a tent compared with the house that your body will be in eternity if you're a Christian. Now I'm over 60 now and my body is showing signs of wear and tear. My father got to the age of 89 and, and his body was really suffering uh, the age of eight, the effects of aging. But in eternity... My body won't have any aches and pains. I won't get exhausted. It'll be just wonderful. And you young people uh, who aren't, uh, I hope, too troubled by physical aches and pains, you've got things in your lives that trouble you, that cause you uh, pain, anxiety, sadness. And the Bible says those things will all be gone in the life that followers of Jesus enter in eternity. There'll be fullness of joy and absence of fear. No more sorrow or crying or pain. Only perfect fulfillment and peace. And you'll experience the, the full reality of God's love for you. The love that Ephesians 3 says surpasses all knowledge. And is higher and deeper and wider than anything you could imagine. The next life will be infinitely longer and infinitely better than this one. And in Jesus you have a place there. As Richard told us last week as he preached from John 14. And it's only confidence in that. Which makes authentic Christian living possible. Otherwise we will always live for what we can get in this life. Or we will at best hedge our bets. Now, what we can get will be different for each of us. It's very easy, isn't it, to point the finger at those who do it for money. They're an easy target and they deserve to be. But it doesn't need to be money that we're after. It can be power to control and get our own way. It can be uh, admiration for being uh, the most gifted or the most caring It can be for the satisfaction that comes from being the helper rather than the helped. Authentic and effective Christian work can only happen when we are confident in the reality and the quality of eternal life so that we hold lightly to the things of this world, the money, power, status, admiration of our peers, and live instead for eternity. It's what makes the therefore possible. But there's a second aspect to the gospel as Paul presents it in our reading. And if confidence in eternal life makes the therefore possible, then the second aspect is what actually causes it to happen. The second aspect of the gospel is that we are totally unworthy to actually enter that wonderful eternal life. But that God has given it to us on the basis of faith in the death of his son, Jesus Christ. We are enabled to regard no one from a worldly point of view by having confidence in the promise of eternal life. But we are caused to regard no one from a worldly point of view by knowing that we ourselves are sinners saved by grace. In our reading, Paul alludes to it by referring to the judgment seat of Christ. And in the bit we didn't read, he refers to the death of Christ. It's a reminder that God is a holy God. 
who judges by the standard of perfect love and that the Bible is correct to say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all failed to be good enough and to do enough good to be allowed into this perfect everlasting life on our own merits. But God in his great love gave his only begotten son that all who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As 2 Corinthians 5 goes on, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Even the faith that saves us has been given to us by God, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, so that no one can boast. And so there's no place in authentic Christianity for self-righteousness. In the end, that's why we don't judge a person's worth in the way that the world does. Firstly, because the world judges a person's worth according to comparisons. You know, we naturally tend, don't we, to rank people as either better or worse than ourselves. And oftentimes we will judge them as worse. I remember hearing a preacher suggest that David Attenborough might be the worst sinner in the world because he knows the natural world inside out. He knows more about the complexities and the wonder of nature than anyone else and yet he denies the existence of the Creator God. And I heard this and I thought, well, you know, there's a logic there. But it didn't sound right. It, it didn't sit right with me. I wondered why. I couldn't put my finger on it. Later in prayer I realised, ah, David Attenborough can't be the worst sinner in the world. Because I am. Paul said, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. A follower of Jesus should never dare to compare themselves favourably with another person. And secondly, we don't regard a person in the way the world does because the world judges a person's worth according to external and in the end very shallow things. Wealth, ability, achievement, looks, colour. And we know that God didn't judge us according to any of those things. When God saved us, it wasn't because of any of those things. God saved us because he loved us. And he loved us because he made us. Period. And we're, because we're grateful not to have been judged by God according to wealth, ability, achievement, looks, colour, we don't judge others that way either. No, we love because God first loved us. Because it's such a big issue now, and rightly so, Let's just consider for a moment the issue of judging a person on the basis of their skin colour. We may have reservations about the Black Lives Matter movement as a movement. As a Christian, I can't approve of violent or lawless behaviour. But as a Christian, I actually can't have any reservations about the idea that a black life is of equal value to a white life. And I can't have any reservations about the idea that no one should have their character prejudged on the basis of their skin colour. I have to affirm these things as a follower of Jesus. And one of the things the Black Lives Matter movement has done is to point out the extent to which black people are not treated as of equal value to white people and often have their character prejudged on the basis of their skin colour. Not only in America, but here. And I think that those of us who are white don't realise the advantage that we have and how life in Britain is harder for those who don't have a white skin. And some of us have been caused to look inside ourselves and have realised to our shame that
that we have a certain amount of colour, prejudice lurking there too. Now people of colour aren't the only people who are discriminated against. Disabled people get a hard time in society. Arguably women are disadvantaged compared with men. Ageism uh, is a, a feature of society and not a good one. Because these are the sort of things that a world, the world uses when it regards people, when it judges the worth of a person. Wealth, ability, success, looks, gender, colour. But, says Paul, we play by different rules. Because of the gospel itself, following Jesus means seeing the inherent worth of each individual person and not making an assessment based on any of those things. The gospel means that we can dare to treat others of, as being of inherent value. Because of the confidence we have in eternal life, we are freed from the need to jostle for position in this life. And we can live with our hands and our hearts open towards others. You know, I was driving on the motorway the other day and uh, I realised I was in that mindset, you know, where all the other drivers were like potential enemies of mine. I was, I, you know, all trying to get one over on me, all trying to get into my, my space. And I was like, you know, uh, and I suddenly thought, what am I, what am I doing? What am I thinking? You know, we're not enemies, we're fellow travellers. As, follow, as a follower of Jesus, my aim should not be to protect my interests at all costs, but to do my bit to help other motorists get to where they're going safely. Even if it means losing a bit of ground myself. And Jesus calls us to live our whole life like that. And when we're confident in the reality and the quality of the eternal life we have in him, we can. And if we properly understand the gospel message, I suggest not only that we can live like that, but we will live like that. Because we'll see that nothing we received from God was deserved or earned, not by our good works or by our good character. It was all a gift of God's mercy and grace. Just to close, I want to tell you something uh, about something that's informed my work, such as it is, uh, with the homeless in Bristol. I mention them because that's a group of people who are used to being considered of no value, except possibly to make us feel better about ourselves and, and to be the recipients of our kindness. It's a poem that used to be on the wall of the, the office uh, in the homeless centre, and it described how... We all want to be the person giving out the soup. And none of us want to be the shuffler in the queue. And yet it said, in effect, we are all the shufflers in God's queue. None of us have earned the right to look down on anyone. Spiritually, none of us have a big fat bank account. We're all spiritually bankrupt. And the poem ended, let your bankrupts feed me. You know, I, don't like, I don't know if you like that picture of the kingdom of God. Maybe you think it's too negative. Uh, but I like it because I'm spiritually bankrupt. In me lives no good thing. The only good thing about me is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Isn't that the sort of church we need? Isn't that the sort of world we need where every person is valued for who they are, not according to what they bring to the table, not according to their wealth, status, ability, class, gender, colour, where the needy are made to feel needed in a good way, not just bit players in the great drama of our competence and our kindness, but needed because they are valued for who they are. Can it be done? If it can be done anywhere, it can be done in the church. By us, by followers of Jesus who are secure in God's matchless love for us and in the value he places on us. 
which is a value not based on any attribute or achievement, but simply on who we are. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for your word, your word which is truth. Lord, I would ask that uh, you would impress your word upon our hearts and our minds. Lord, uh, your, your written word which is without error and your, the preached word in, in so far as it's been according to the truth and your will. Lord, uh, help us to make the gospel, Lord, always the driver of, of all our beliefs and our attitudes and our behaviour. Always, help us always to put the gospel on the left-hand side of our therefore and to live for your glory. Lord, we thank you for your great salvation and we give you praise and honour in the name of the one who died for us to open the, the gates of heaven. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. We hope you have been blessed and that you will join us again next week. Same time, same place. And now a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Oh,